Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. Professor Dweck, first of all, I'd like to know, why did you decide to write the book, The Scandal of Kabbalah? Uh, it's a very provocative name, but the story of Le Rav Leon de Modena is not very well known by people. I'm curious to know why you wrote about him and, and uh, what is it about him that captivated you? It's a really good question. Um, so let me step back for a little bit and tell our audience a little bit about uh, who Leon Modena was, um, when he lived and where he lived. He was born in 1571 in Venice, and he died in Venice um, in 1648. Uh, for most of his life, he lived in the city of Venice. There were a few periods early on in his life when he lived elsewhere um, in what we call Italy um, or the Italian peninsula. He lived almost his entire life in Venice, which, as we know, um, the Jews lived in a ghetto at that time period. It was very dense, um, almost claustrophobic surroundings. There were several thousand Jews in a very relatively small space. And he had a very thorough rabbinic education, and he spent most of his life as a preacher um, and as a teacher. He worked in print shops, and um, he gained money and lost money from a whole series of professions. He was never a particularly wealthy man, and he struggled with um, financial problems almost his entire life. He wrote. He wrote in a lot of different genres, um, and he wrote in multiple languages. He wrote in mostly in Hebrew, but some in Italian as well. What is very interesting about him is he is a man who was keenly attuned to how a text circulates in his own lifetime. This is a man who worked in a print shop, who printed his own books. Um, and some of his most interesting books actually circulated only in manuscript and he never printed them. So his criticism of Christianity, which he wrote at the end of his life, um, which was probably left unfinished, a book called Magen Vacharev, only circulated in manuscript. Um, the book that was uh, published in English as his autobiography, but may actually be more like a journal, was also um, only circulated in manuscript. And the book that I wrote um, about several years ago that you mentioned in, uh, in a book called The Scandal of Kabbalah, Modena's text is called Arinohem. Uh, it's a quotation from the book of Mishle or Proverbs, Arinohem, a roaring lion. And um, Modena wrote this book towards the end of his life, but not quite at the end of his life. It was written in 1639. And unlike his criticism of Christianity, which was left unfinished at the time of his death, this book was completed. It's a, it stands as a complete text. It's 30 chapters, there's an introduction. It's very clear that he completed it. Um, and he also, again, did, print the, did not print this book. And the reason why, just so I interrupt real quickly on this point, um, regarding using manuscript instead of um, regular print, is, is that because they wanted to avoid censorship from like the printers? Is that why he, he opted for that? Is that why people usually opt for manuscripts versus publishing it in, in the print house? So that's a very, very good question, Ben. Um, and I think we need to be honest with what we do know, what we don't know. Um, we don't know exactly why he doesn't print this book. I think there are a number of reasons um, that we can make informed um, guesswork. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit more than guesswork. So the first and most important thing we have to remember is printing a book costs money. It's expensive. Um, the most expensive thing in the early modern period in terms of printing a book was the paper, which was very expensive. Um, and it's not clear that there was money to print this book. Um, either that Modena had, either that Modena would have had the money himself, or that he could have found backers. That's one. Two is the contents of this book are somewhat controversial, and it could be that he did not want to have these the the contents of this book appear in print for his own reasons, not having to do with fear of censorship, but simply he didn't want his name associated with this kind of material in print. Um, Related to that um, is the issue of censorship, but I think another issue has to do with audience. This is a book that um, is a very long letter. It's a very long letter that he writes to um, uh, a small coterie of um, students and, and relatives 
And it's not clear that he wants this book to circulate um, in print where anyone, you know, with who with reading knowledge of the Hebrew language would be theoretically able to pick up a, a, print, a printed copy of the book and read it. Mm -hmm. um, but I still haven't really answered your first question, which is, um, why did I decide to write a book about this? We've talked a little bit now about, we've, tried, we've situated him in terms of time and space, right? He's in Venice at the turn of the 17th century. Um, he's a rabbi, he's a preacher, he's not particularly wealthy. Um, he has a number of children, some of whom run into pretty serious issues, which he details in um, his autobiography. Um, but we have to understand something about the intellectual world of the Jews in the late 16th and early 17th century. Um, probably the most dominant factor um, in the intellectual and cultural world of um, the late 16th and early 17th century was Kabbalah. Right. Now, what is Kabbalah? We'll get there in a minute um, and we'll talk about what it is. Modena was um, ambivalent about Kabbalah um, and he, uh, he was quite devoted to Maimonides and the Guide of the Perplexed and the Mishneh Torah. Um, and one of the reasons why he wrote this book, Ari Nohem, is to set out this argument, um, sort of arguing for Maimonidean rationalism in the face of um, the spread of Kabbalah. So I said, I said that we haven't really defined Kabbalah. Let's try to define it. Um, it's a very, it's a very difficult thing to, um, to, to, to put one's finger down and to sort of say, oh, it's, it's this, this, this particular thing. But let's, let's try. The word Kabbalah is a Hebrew word. It means um, quite simply tradition. Um, and when scholars refer to um, Kabbalah, they tend to mean one of several things. The first is they mean a set of concepts that um, are associated with um, medieval Jewish theology, um, such as the transmigration of the soul, such as um, tikkun or restoration or um, devekut or communion with God. So Kabbalah refers to a set of ideas most at the most basic level. Um, and probably the most important set of ideas related to Kabbalah is the sfirot or the Godhead being mapped out into 10 different spheres. But Kabbalah also refers to a library of texts, right? Certain texts are known um, as Kabbalistic, the Zohar, Sefer HaBahir, Ma'arechet HaElohut, um, and one can go on, but there is a library of Kabbalistic books. Kabbalah can also refer to a set of religious practices, right? Things, certain, certain um, um, the performance of certain commandments in certain ways can be deemed Kabbalistic. Um, and, Gershom Sholem wrote a really wonderful essay um, about um, the ritual of the Kabbalists, um, which I urge you all and all your listeners to read. So we have, a, it's a library of texts, it's a set of concepts, it's, um, it's a series of practices, and it also refers to a sort of tradition or a set of wisdom that is um, passed on between a set of elites. Um, and it tends to be, it tends in the late Middle Ages, it's taught from teacher to student, and it's not public, right? It's esoteric rather than exoteric. For a variety of factors, beginning in the late 15th century and continuing up until our present day, but really in the period that we're talking about, continuing for about 150 years, Kabbalah spreads. It's no longer the preserve of a small group of intellectual elites. One of the crucial factors has to do with geography and the human mobility of Jews, right? Um, Western Europe empties its Jews in the late uh, Middle Ages, and Jews spread throughout the Mediterranean basin and in other parts of Europe where they're allowed to live, and they bring with them their books and they bring them with them their wisdom. That's one basic issue in terms of human mobility. Probably a second as basic issue is technological, right? Kabbalistic books begin to appear in print very early on. And by the late 16th century, almost every single major Kabbalistic book has appeared in print. There are exceptions, but almost every single major Kabbalistic book has appeared in print. Some in multiple editions, right? The Zohar has appeared in print several times already, right? There's the 1551 and then the 15, um, uh, excuse me, there's the, I, I think I'm getting my dates wrong. Um, but by the end of the 156, by the end of the 1550s, there are two editions of the Zohar that have appeared in print. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another uh, crucial thing. 
The third crucial element um, that uh, relates to the spread of Kabbalah has to do with the explosion and the explosive rise of a new center of Jewish culture in Tzfat in Palestine or in the Ottoman Empire. And Tzfat, the, the rise of Tzfat is as spectacular as its fall, right? It's like the shooting comet across the, the sky of Jewish culture in the 16th century. But for a period of almost half, 40 to 50 years, basically anyone who's anyone in the world of Jewish life and letters is in Tzfat and um, generating new Kabbalistic ideas. And these ideas have enormous attraction to Jews living throughout the rest of the world. This is the world that Modena enters into um, in the late, late 16th and early 17th century. And I think that gives us some sense of how he saw his own worldview which was very much wedded to the world of Maimonides uh, mm. under assault and why he sort of wanted to put pen to paper um, in writing this book called Ari Nohem or The Roaring Lion. Well, it was definitely under assault in the sense where even if the you know Ramak version of Kabbalah and that which came before was very different than the Kabbalah developed by Isaac Luria's uh, students. Because again, he was a very, kind of a enigmatic figure. There's a lot of mystery around him. He being Luria, not Luria. Not, Luria, Luria. Should we tell your listeners who Ramak was? Ramak is the abbreviation for uh, Moshe Cordovero yes. or Moses Cordovero, who writes a, a very, very important book, which appears in print also called Pardes Rimonim. Mm -hmm. um, and what is so important about Pardes Rimonim is that it is effectively a translation of the Maimonidean um, midot uh, into the Kabbalistic spheres. And Modena knows this book quite well and has some um, pretty cutting things to say about it. But Cordovero is in Tzfat, as is Luria. Um, and these are sort of the two figures um, whose right. theology um, takes over the Jewish world. Well, the, the theology of, of, uh, of Yitzhak Luria, some of his revelations came from, there was this trend in Tzfat to they received like revelations from uh, Magid, which right. is a Magid. heavenly mentor. A heavenly mentor, exactly. and not only in Tzfat, right? Um, we know that Moses Chaim Lutzato has a heavenly mentor in Padua in the early 18th century. Um, Joseph yeah, Paro later. has a heavenly mentor in Tzfat itself, who calls it, who, the, and his heavenly mentor calls itself the Mishnah. That the Magid or the heavenly mentor is a technology that is sort of well known. Um, in the late Middle Ages and throughout the early modern period, I dare say there are probably still many Magidim in the world right now um, who communicate with the sort of divine elect, with, with the elect and, 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 and have them write down their secrets. Well, well the, um, danger, the danger is that like someone like Nathan of Gaza also has a Magid. So, you know, we, the whole point that I feel like I understand where Modena, Modena was coming from, he felt like, that's not, if you're calling it Kabbalah, you're calling it received tradition, we have a received tradition of Rebbe to student. And the Gemara talks about, you know, Maaseh Merkaba and how it's subjective and it's oral and it's taught over. And all of a sudden there is these ideas of the Godhead, very Gnostic and Neoplatonic uh, Neo um, in, in terms of like how it's structured. So in, from his point of view, it seems very foreign. And it also starts to infiltrate into, you know, law. So I feel like that's where he, Correct me if I'm wrong, that's where he feels a little bit, you know, like he has, he's a little bit on the defensive. So I think this is, there, you said a lot, and there's a lot in what you said. Let's take the last thing first. Um, one of the things that I think Modena objects to is the confusion of categories that you just mentioned, which is that um, it's not that he objects to the Zohar as such. It's that when people start to read the Zohar as a legal book, right, and to use it as a um, source to determine the law, then he begins to get very nervous. But we should, we should add that probably the most important figure to do this is Joseph Caro, right. um, who Modena is ambivalent about, right? There's a sort of very cutting comment that he makes about the Shulchan Aruch in um, Ari Nohem, um, which I talk about in, my, in, in the Scandal of Kabbalah a little bit. Um, but I think exactly what you said in terms of once the Zohar becomes no, not only a homiletic book or an exegetical book to understand um, the Bible and to use as a sort of source for sermons um, in the synagogue, but it becomes a way, well, okay, let's figure out um, 
um, whether or not one should um, uh, wear tefillin on Cholam Oed, right? Mm -hmm. that, becomes, that becomes something that um, gets a Maimonidean rationalist very, very nervous. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, if, if I recall correctly from your book, you mentioned that, um, you know, you here, I actually have it right in front of me, on the uh -oh. in the introduction, uh oh. Well, actually, just going to what you're saying, um, he has. You said that you examine Modena's substantive criticism of Kabbalah, his analysis of the Zohar, its authorship and its reception, his rejection of the myth of Isaac Luria, his objection to the appropriation of Kabbalah by leading Christian theologians, and his attempt to resurrect Maimonides as a cultural hero and intellectual model. The part that actually strikes me is um, the Christian polemics, because he also write, you mentioned before that he wrote about a book about against Christianity. So he, there's obviously some type of overlap here. Um, maybe you can expand on, on that. Sure, so I, um, I think we should, we should alert our listeners. Now we're gonna start, but now we're going down a different rabbit hole, um, <laughs> which is the rabbit hole of um, Christianity and Christian Kabbalah. So what is Christian Kabbalah, right? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a very important question. And you know, there are scholars who have argued that Kabbalah itself is Christian. Right, um, so all Kabbalah is Christian. Um, this was a sort of famous argument um, that was made in the sort of late twentieth century by a number of scholars. Um, but let's 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 talk about the category of Christian Kabbalah, beginning in the late Middle Ages, but really increasing in the in the middle of the fifteenth century um, or in the second half of the fifteenth century with a figure by the name of Pico della Mirandola. Um, Christian intellectuals, mostly Catholic, but before the Reformation, obviously, but then even after the Reformation, Protestants get involved as well. Um, begin to start, uh, begin to study Kabbalah. Now, why are they studying Kabbalah? It's pretty clear that they are studying Kabbalah because they think that it is going to allow them to unlock the secrets of the Hebrew Bible, which will allow them to teach both their audience and possibly um, potential converts amongst the Jews to the, the, the secrets of the Christian faith whether it be the Trinity or the incarnation or the resurrection, um, any, any number of aspects of Christian theology. Uh, this, this um, whether we call it a current or trend in early modern intellectual life, um, picks up a lot of um, energy over the course of the 16th century. And particularly in a city like Venice, where there's a figure by the name of Guillaume Postel, who is a major Christian Kabbalist. This is the world in which um, Modena uh, lived in. And one of Modena's, Modena's opposition to Christian Kabbalah is pretty similar to his opposition to Jewish Kabbalah, with sort of one little um, ironic twist. But Modena repeats um, a responsum by Yitzhak Bar Sheshet, a uh, late medieval Iberian um, jurist or um, posek, as one might say, who in one of his responses says, um, uh, the Christians believe in the decad, right? Um, the, uh, excuse me, the Christians believe in the Trinity, but the Kabbalists believe in the decad, right? The, 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 for the Christians, um, the Godhead is divided into three, but for the Kabbalists, the Godhead is divided into 10. Modena repeats this a number of times, both in Arinohem and elsewhere in his writings. And it seems that um, Modena in term has, doesn't have a lot of um, uh, patience for Christian theology. Um, and I think you see this in his, um, his big book, Magen Vacherev. Um, but he is not as quite um, as anti-Christian as some of his other um, Jewish colleagues over the course of the 16th and 17th century. On the spectrum, he's nowhere near the most polemical anti-Christian um, uh, Jew that lived in the early modern period. But he sees Kabbalah as, or he sees Christian studying Kabbalah as something that should be combated. Um, and he sees it also as being, being done with a sort of conversionary um, pressure, right? That the Christians are studying Kabbalah so they can use Kabbalah to convert possible potential Jews right. to Christianity. And we know, we know from a whole series of social historians and articles that they've written, some of which I cite, some of which have come out after this book was written, that Christians do use Kabbalah to convert Jews um, oh, exactly. to Christianity in the early modern period. Even today, uh, if you go to Jews for Jesus, um, their website, their whole argument for Jesus practically is based on Kabbalah. 
based on the Zohar. I'm, like, I'm a historian of the 17th century. I do not make comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just say it's just, it's, just, it's funny how they're still using it because it's like, uh, you know, you'll see the Abba Iman Zeir Anpin, you know, you'll see all uh-huh. the, okay. the, trying to find the uh, And now I have something to look at when we're done. Yeah, with yeah. Our, it's just it's fascinating that they're still using it as you know, as as a way for arguing for Jesus in, you know, in the Jewish tradition. But obviously the Modena's way of trying to reestablish the Maimonidean, uh, you know, approach to Judaism is in a way like it's, it's, it naturally fights off any Christian notion uh, of, of God because God in Rambam's view is completely and utterly um, transcendent. And there's no I mean, wait, wait, hold on. I just want to go back to one thing that you said. Modena um, has a slightly, has a relatively nuanced view on Jesus as a historical figure. Um, and, and this is one of the areas where I think he's actually quite different from some of um, both his own contemporary Jews, but later Jews also who are just rapidly anti-Christian whenever it comes to anything related to Christianity. Modena actually has a, a, a David Berger wrote a really wonderful article um, uh, in the Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi Feshrift about um, the attitudes towards the historical Jesus. And the very end of that article concludes with Modena's account of Jesus. Modena's account of Jesus in Magen Becherev is quite sophisticated um, for an early modern um, rabbinic intellectual. Um, and he's, he, it's not quite as polemical as so much of what he says about um, uh, other aspects of um, Christianity. Um, and I think it's important to make that distinction because um, one of the things that happens over the course of the early modern period and then throughout the modern period is the Jewish recovery of Jesus. And I don't mean by the Jews for Jesus, but I mean Jewish intellectuals who start to recover Jesus as um, as a figure and sort of the shifting of the creation of Christianity as a as a religion or as what we might call a religion, but religion is kind of too weak a word, to later figures, whether it be Paul um, or other figures. Aneta Stahl has written a really wonderful book about the recovery of Jesus in 20th century Hebrew and Yiddish literature called Other and Brother. Um, G- Abraham Geiger um, writes about Jesus quite quite extensively. Jacob Emden writes about Jesus in ways that are quite positive. Um, so I think um, one of the things that happens over the course of the last 400 years, the Jews become slightly more nuanced in their views of Jesus as a historical figure versus the rest of Christianity. Fascinating. And um, I wanted to also ask you, because you brought up uh, Yaakov Emden, there's also uh, Yichia Khafi. And um, you know many others who said that either parts of the Zohar, or the entire Zohar, is a forgery. Um, I I wanted to just mention for because others might not be aware of this um, that the, like the main arguments that they make against it um, is that for example um, it was found by Moshe de Leon randomly. Moshe de Leon lived like a century after the Rambam. He didn't have uh, you know he he was a professional copyist. His wife and his daughter. When they were asked where where he got this from, they both said that he he made it up for you know financial uh, benefit. Um, there's it's a strange dialect of Aramaic. It's uh, pseudepigrapha. It's written in, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but it's there are words in Ladino. Um, the author knew of cantillation and accent marks that didn't exist till many centuries later. Um, Chazal never mentioned it. The Amoraim. Were, there were a few Amorai mentioned in it who didn't who lived probably 150 years after 150 years after uh, Rabbi Shimon's life, and um, you know there's countless other. Rabbi Yaakov Emden mentions about 280 proofs that show that it's not um, written by Rabbi Shimon Yochai. And today, a lot of you know people are more open to this idea that the Zohar isn't written by Rabbi Shimon Yochai, but um, it's definitely taken. It, it has a stronghold on on Judaism today. It kind of you know transformed everything. So I, I want to understand like why was it so significant for Leon de Modena to focus on the Zohar of all things? Um, so you said a lot, and there's a lot of what you said. Um, let's um, let's let's um, let's think about um, what the Zohar is first of all. Um, it's not clear that the Zohar is a book until it appears in print um, in um, between this period, between 1558 and 1560. Um, 
um, in Cremona and Mantua. Um, probably the most important scholar working on the Zohar today is Daniel Abrams, and he's written extensively um, about the Zohar corpus before um, it appears in print as a book, right? So the question of what the Zohar is, is not a simple question. Um, let's talk about the Zohar corpus in the late Middle Ages. And once you have it appear in print, we can speak about the book, the Zohar as a book. Um, the book is ascribed um, to the, the, the Tana Shimon Bar Yochai. Um, that being said, it's written, as you mentioned before, in a dialect of Aramaic that um, is clearly not the dialect of Aramaic um, that was written, that the Babylonian Talmud was written in. I'm not a um, Semitic philologist, so I can't really speak about this, but I know the, only the, 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 the research of other scholars. Like you said, there are a number of anachronisms. Um, there are words in romance that appear in the book. Um, and scholars, um, I think at a certain point in his writing, Gershom Sholem referred to the fact that the Zohar was not written by, Yochai, by Shimon Bar Yochai as a whispered tradition, right? So there has been talk of the fact that the Zohar had not been written by Shimon Bar Yochai for centuries. Um, and what Mosina does in Arino Hem for the first time is he brings all of the evidence together, including a famous letter by Isaac of Akko um, that, was a, that appeared in Sefer Yuchasin for the first time. Mm -hmm. And he comes up with a narrative theory of the actual authorship of the Zohar, which is right, it's composed by Moshe de Leon. It's ascribed to Shimon Bar Yochai. Um, the early readers of the Zohar accept the book as a work of Shimon Bar Yochai. Most lay people then and now accept the work as a book of Shimon Bar Yochai. Um, and Modena tries to um, place the book in time and place, which is a historical, which is a historical argument. So you ask why it's so important to do this. I think one of the crucial reasons why it's so important to do this is relates to what we said earlier, which is, has to do with the fact that the Zohar um, readers had been reading the work of the Zohar as a work of homiletics or work of exegesis. But beginning in the 16th century, possibly even earlier, but I think beginning in the 16th century with full force and certainly in the 17th century, scholars begin to read the Zohar as a legal book and they begin to use it to decide halakha. Um, and that is something that people who are committed to Maimonidean rationalism and committed to um, a uh, Maimonidean view of the world object to. And Modena is one of the people who objects to this um, most cogently and also sort of um, laying out his theory in most coherently. Those are some of the reasons why I think he has to do that. There are other reasons which has to do with the fact that the Zohar is the most important book of Kabbalah once it's a book. Mm. And so if you're going to write a criticism of Kabbalah, you have to attack um, the, the, the really crucial, the crucial text. I mean, the other figure or the other issue that Mosner has to attack is the cult of personality that has arisen around the figure of Isaac Luria um, with the miracle stories and with um, the Shifchei Ha'ari or the in praise of the Ari or in praise of Isaac Luria. And um, these, are, these are the sort of central um, issues that he has to attack. And why? Because in Venice, in the synagogues, in the ghetto of Venice, everyone wants to study Kabbalah. No one wants to study Maimonides. And Mogana thinks this is a real problem. Yeah, and you can argue that a lot of this, the Sfat school kind of indirectly paved the way for um, Sabbateanism. So, you know, some could argue that, maybe Sholem argues against that, but um, it's pretty clear that, you know, I think that the issue that a lot of Maimonideans have is not just the legal issue, it's the issue of the Godhead and understanding how you know, God relates to us and how it's theurgical. Kabbalah is like how we control, we control the heavens and everything we we kind of like can twist God's arm. Uh, this idea is antithetical to the Maimonidean uh, worldview, the view, worldview of Andalusia and that which came before. So in a sense, if you're, you know, if you're attacking our conception of God, uh, the unity principle, then all of reality gets affected by that. So um, we see that's why Kabbalah leads to a lot of um, weird mystical ideas or weird superstitions and almost seemingly idolatrous practices today that are byproducts of that. You don't really see that come from 
any other, you know, like from Maimonidean school, you don't see it leading to um, those things. So I, I kind of understand where Modena is coming from it from that from that angle. I don't know if it's necessarily legal because even in Shulchan Aruch, it's a small part of the Shulchan Aruch. It's not even it's it's almost insignificant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you said again. There was a lot in what you said. Let's 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 um, unpack um, some of the, um, the some of the issues one by one. Um, what the relationship between Kabbalah and or the spread of Luriana Kabbalah and and the rise of Shabtai Tzvi and the, the Sabatian movement is um, a question to which there's no real there's no real answer. Um, some scholars see um, Luriana Kabbalah as one of the causes. Um, for the rise of the Sabatian movement. And others see the Sabatian movement as itself um, a primary cause for the spread of Luriana and Kabbalah afterwards, um, after the, the, the conversion of Shabtai Tzvi. Um, there's probably evidence for both. Um, and um, uh, there's probably not one reason why Shabtai Tzvi and the Sabatian movement that coalesced around him was so successful for um, the period of time that it was before it was not successful. Um, Sholem certainly saw the spread of Luriana Kabbalah as the um, the preparing the ground for the um, rise of Shabtai Tzvi and Sabatianism. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the Zohar and um, 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 Maimonides, I think it's important to realize that um, for Modena the 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 text that he that he tells his students to and his and his um and his grandson to 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 study again and again is the guide of the perplexed and there is a way in which he uh, um he asks them to read the guide of the perplexed almost as um, a sort of therapeutic agent um right that they should study it um over and over again so as to um try to understand the world try to understand um what God wants. Um, try to understand what um, the purpose of the commandments is. Um, and I think that um, what he's trying to do with Ari Nohem is to reorient the discussion away from the Zohar towards the guide of the perplexed. Um, and as I said in the book, um, The Scandal of Kabbalah, I mean, I think he's a complete, this is the, the, the book is a complete failure. Um, he fails on every level, right? Um, over the course of the next two centuries, Kabbalah spreads. Um, you know, the Guide of the Perplex is printed in 1551 and then again in 1553, but then it's not printed again until 1740. Um, uh, Modena's student, Yosef Hamid, becomes an avid Sabatian. Um, uh, the grandson, who's his copyist, um, it becomes a Kabbalist. Um, and I think this goes some way to explaining why he doesn't print the book. He knows that he's sort of fighting a rear guard action. Mm -hmm. um, against um, forces that are much larger than he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, it sometimes opposition to the Kabbalah movement is met with uh, violence. So not necessarily within his 